Hello YouTube! I just wanted to take this opportunity to kind of ease you into what's coming. In the following couple of clips, I will show you some of the, what I like to call the Omniwheel pinch wheel extruder, which is essentially what it says on the tin. It is a pinch wheel extruder for Rotoforge that uses a Omniwheel of my own design, well, of a modified design that I borrowed from another one online, obviously. Um, I'll post a link to it in the description, but it uses this modified Omniwheel design that has a bunch of M2 washers on a keyring mounted between a sandwich of printed hubs to pinch and push a segment of chopped wire, not continuous wire as we've tried previously with Rotoforge. We ran into a problem where the continuous cold working of the wire higher up away from the die as it friction couples to the die in rotation and is pinned by a standard pinch wheel extruder causes the wire to eventually break off due to cold working. And there really wasn't a clear way to solve that problem. Uh, perhaps sufficiently clever closed loop control of the feed of the wire per unit speed of the motor and the right size die and the right choice of materials could overcome it, but it's not clear to me how to solve that problem. There isn't a present engineering solution. It would require a lot of fairly in-depth basic science. And I'm, I'm interested in that, but it's not really what I'm trying to do with Rotoforge. It, it's not conducive to stepping forward with the project in the direction I'd like to go. So I've opted to add a wire chopper from the Smuff project and uh, using a razor blade and a servo, it cuts the wire into segments, and this segmented wire is then direct driven with a extruder module with an omni wheel and a basically a sliding peak carbon pad, carbon peak pad on the other side, down directly into the die motor, directly over the top of the die motor. And the wire chopper and a spool feeding motor assembly sits where the extruder on the end of three used to be. So I'm still putting all this together, and it's still got a ways to go before it actually all works, because each individual thing has to be basically individually designed and individually engineered to function with metal wire less than a millimeter in diameter. I think I'm targeting 0.9 millimeter wire because it's a standard welding wire size. Uh, a lot of people have suggested in the past, and it's small enough that I can get reasonably high contact pressures at the end of the wire for uh, 30 newtons of pushing force or so, which is about what I can expect to get from a standard NEMA 17 stepper motor at the end of a one centimeter diameter wheel. But all the details aside, uh, or all the details aside for a moment, uh, this short segment of videos is just about my last few little uh, iterations of the Omni pinch wheel extruder. Um, and then there will probably be a separate set of videos for a all linear actuator driven design that I went through and a few other things that I've done in the inner room, uh, in addition to blog posts that I'll put links to in the description. So, sorry to have such a long-winded introduction, but with no further ado, here are a few videos of me futzing about with this device that I built and showing it functioning. The next step, of course, will be mounting it on the actual gantry and testing it with a single strand of wire constrained inside a Bowden tube uh, as it's fed into the extruder and into the die, the die motor, the motor in the die, and see if we can print with it. Uh, so, thanks a lot for watching. And I hope that some of this is at least mildly interesting, watching me make something and fail, and then make it again and have it kind of work. So, thanks. So, uh, okay, uh, it looks like this is actually kind of working. There's a bit of stickiness to it, but I might be able to work it out. So what I'm going to do here just trim this by hand if I can. But you can see it is slippy, but it does work. It's very clicky too, it's kind of strange. Don't ask me to retract it though. So the gaps, this is a 0.9 millimeter wire by the way, made of aluminum, and these are stainless steel M2 washers wrapped around key rings that are mounted on plastic hubs. PLA printed plastic hubs. I have a preloaded clamp here. It clearly needs a little work, a little stabilization there, something. Uh, but it's coming together nicely. It seems to be almost fully functional. 
Uh, I just need to work on the tolerances and the gaps a little more, give the wheels a little more space to ride, maybe take more of the slack out of them because right now, I don't know if you can see it, but they they wobble just, just a hair, just a little bit. And just a little bit of play in them. Let's see how that is. Oh. Yeah, yeah, there you go. You can see it's got a little bit of little bit of play in it. And that causes issues. So I guess I'll be back when I figure all that out. Thanks for watching. I just wanted to go ahead and show the uh, extruder in operation. It, it does work, turns out. No gearbox required. It jams occasionally, but it does push the wire with some consistency. Now I guess I can just test it by hooking the wire into a drill chuck and spinning it while it pushes it. Clearly, we're pretty close to the limit here. There we go. Needs a little help once in a while. Hold on. There we go. Yeah, it actually works pretty reliably. It's not too bad. Could be worse, honestly. Exerts an appreciable amount of force. Maybe 10 or 20 newtons, something like that. Not a huge amount. It's got a pretty good grip on the wire, too. Not bad. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and test with a 09 millimeter aluminum 1100 wire in the extruder, clamped and ready to go. I'm going to start the extruder pushing, and then I'll start a drill here, spinning, and <clears throat> try and rotate the wire while it's being pushed, just a proof of concept. Oh yeah, it's definitely pushing me along. And the wire's not twisting excessively. Oh, it broke off. Okay. Maybe it was twisting. Yeah, there's some evidence of it here. Oh, it's starting to feed it again. Hold on. Yeah, there it is. Let's feed it on through. Hmm. It just got... I don't know if it's sheared or if it just... 
Well, now that you've uh, seen what I've been up to, or at least one of the things I've been up to, I wanted to show you another interesting uh, development. Um, we recently acquired from Rack Robotics a power core, which is a wire EDM machine um, that basically is an, a mod for an Ender 3. Um, so in addition to what I'm doing with the Rotoforge here, uh, trying to use segmented wire feed um, with a free spinning wire segment as the material feedstock going down into the die, pulling from a continuous spool and chopping it into segments on the machine, I think we might go back to the direct thermal approach, um, which we did try briefly at the start of things some years ago. Uh, but basically, in instead of melting a material, we're going to try forge welding it. So the, the reason the EDM machine is important, the, the power core is important, is it allows us to drill ceramics, potentially. So like silicon nitride, for example, the materials that very high-end or I guess very high temperature capable ceramic glow plugs are made of. And if we can drill a whole center bore through a glow plug, uh, if I have one, oh here it is. Yeah, I've got a example right here, um, an NGK second generation high temperature ceramic glow plug. Basically this silicon nitride tip here, I don't know how well you can see it, but is a uh, it's, it's an insulating ceramic encapsulant with tungsten carbide heating elements in it. And between the tungsten carbide heating elements is a more or less empty silicon nitride section. If we can drill a hole right through the middle of this, all the way out the back, we could feed wire down into it and use it as a very fast hot end. It can obtain 1300 degrees Celsius from room temperature at about 3 seconds, and it has very good thermal conductivity. It's very sensitive and has very high power density. This heater uh, runs can, on a maximum power output of something close to 130 watts, which is more than sufficient for 25 cubic millimeters per second of aluminum flowing through a 0.9 millimeter hole at the end of this, if we had one. Um, so in principle, we could raise the temperature of that aluminum flowing through the hole, or being pushed through the hole in the solid state, to its forging temperature around 520 degrees, 540 degrees Celsius for 6061 aluminum. And at that temperature, as this tool rides along a surface with the wire pushing out underneath it, it should, like in Rotoforge, form a flash, spread out. And as it spreads out, this rolling ball, if you like, or this sliding ceramic anvil or hammer, however you want to see it, will forge it into the previous layer that is also being preheated by the heating element as it drives over the surface. Almost like what happens in a clay printer or a butter printer or some other non-viscoplastic material that gets printed through food printers or other operations. I, th I think metals need to be treated in this way. So I figured I'd just go ahead and show you a shot of the power core itself. It's uh, nothing too special. It's a power supply, EDM power supply. It works at like 72 volts with a peak pulse current of about 80 amps uh, mounted on top of the Ender up right here. And uh, the Ender 3 frame underneath with a vat of water and a gridfinity mounting system on the bottom, or basically inside the water vat. You mount a part inside the water vat with one of the clamps or something of that nature. And uh, let me just get closer here. I'll take the camera off and bring you in to get a closer look at it, actually. You can look at what we got set up here. We got some gridfinities with uh, magnets inside here. Actually, it's got a little bit of iron oxide or something. There's the brass electrode that I've hammered into a flat shape to try and cut slots with. This is an electrode holder. It's got a Wago tool in it. Yeah, I'm all out of focus, but it's magnet. It's magnetized as well. This is just a polypropylene vat we acquired from Walmart. And there's the power core itself with its alert current outputs, 24 volt input, and a USB, and some gridfinity holding storage for stock and brass and such. And uh, yeah, and here's a little work holding clamp we use. 
This is also magnetized. Quite nice. It supports flushing of the work and holding sheet stock down. And basically we're going to try and use this thing to cut a through hole in a ceramic glow plug through silicon nitride. Maybe we'll be able to do a direct thermal approach this way and it would greatly simplify everything and make the whole rotoford situation much quieter as well if it does work. But that's for later probably. We've got a long way to go before we can try any of that. As you can see the Rotoforge setup is not in the best of shape right now. I've got several unfinished things here. I got my oh, hold on. Got my uh, smuff style wire chopper with a razor blade and a little servo that pushes it in and out and of, of the filament path, which comes in through this pneumatic fitting and out to the bottom here. And here we've got the pinch wheel extruder. And the pinch wheel extruder will basically go right here, more or less. It will mount on top of the aluminum bracket with two holes to the left. And it will line up the filament path with the top of the motor. And then there will be a pneumatic fitting in here that goes to the exit pneumatic fitting on the bottom of this uh, smuff filament chopper that will be mounted probably back here somewhere where the regular extruder is. And then we'll need some kind of a motor to feed from the wire spool to pull the wire down periodically. And feed it down into the wire chopper and then from there to push it all the way down into the, um, the die motor or into at least the pinch wheel extruder. So, yep, that's pretty much where we're at. I just wanted to give you a quick update as to what we were working on. And, uh, there we go. Hopefully that gives you a better idea. Uh. Mm. Oh, there we go. So, now that I've kind of shown you around what we have, the new tools and uh, some of the features that have been developed so far on our forge, um, I think I'm just going to go ahead and wrap this video up and just let you know that we're still here, still working on it. It's been four months or so since my last update. So, yeah, we're still, still moving forward. Uh, things are more clear than they have been in the past, and even though I'm adding a lot more moving parts and a lot more mechanical complexity to the Rotoforge system, I can at least see how each part will come together and how all the parts should work together in the end to give us the result we're looking for. And I can have good confidence that this assembly of components will yield a functional desktop metal 3D printer. Um, or, I guess, 3D printer for metals on your desktop, since desktop metal is someone's trademark now. But, yeah, that's pretty much where we're at. And hopefully, if we're, everything goes well, maybe the power core will enable us to do something much more mechanically simplistic, closer to regular FDM, or maybe clay extrusion. Um, if you're familiar with clay extrusion, there's good reason to believe that such a thing is possible if you get the printing temperature correct and you can deal with the thermal conductivity of the metals you're depositing. Which I think we can, given the power density of the glow plugs. Um, just doing a few basic tests by hand, which I've recorded and may include here in this video or in another set, uh, it does appear to be possible to forge weld using just the tip of a glow plug and some chunks of wire. So. It's encouraging, and there's a lot of possibilities here. But I'm still very excited by the project, and I think that we can do what we set out to do, which is bring metal, plastic, and ceramic additive manufacturing of high quality onto the home desktop at a low cost. So, uh, you know, basically trying to address the issues with limited access to tooling, equipment, materials that many of us face, especially here in the U.S., which is very strange. Um, you know, even though, even if we have money, often lead times are very long, or because of uh, obscure laws or something of that nature, it can be very difficult to um, find the parts and materials you need on the time basis you need them in order to test new ideas, new experiments, to build things, uh, and to create really what was the backbone of, well, never mind, I'm not going to pontificate, but... Um, yeah, so I hope this gives you an idea of where we're at, and 
brings you up to speed with what we're doing a little bit. So I'm going to try and keep my updates a little more consistent, but classes are starting up again, and I'm still working on my PhD at the same time. So I've got a lot of things going on. Uh, I'll do my best, but we'll see what happens. So thanks a lot for watching if you've gone this far with me, and uh, hopefully we'll have something really interesting to show in the next few months or so. Thanks a lot.